The Titanic carried 3,300 passengers and crew. Nearly half of them lost their lives on the night of April 14, 1912. But the stories of the Titanic live on. On the ship were millionaires, artists, fashionistas, bakers, cookers, musicians, doctors, and con men. These are their stories. Welcome to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode in our series on The Last Night on the Titanic. We're looking at the cast of characters who were there on the fateful night the Titanic went down. And then we're also looking at aspects of the culture on the Titanic that go beyond just the different classes, the workers, the vendors, the cooks, those who made the Titanic what it was and delving more into their story. So as always, I'm here with Veronica. Thank you. Veronica, how are you doing? I'm doing well. All right. Someone we're going to look at Well, a genre of people we're going to look at, I think it's going to be very interesting. And we're going to look at writers on the Titanic. And this isn't something I really ever thought of or considered, but it makes perfect sense that there would have been writers. Before we get into them, there's something I'm curious about. Did the writers who were on the Titanic really contribute to the crafting of the narrative that we know about the Titanic today? Or was it other people? How did they contribute to this story? Yes, Scott, actually, there were several journalists on board, and journalist Lawrence Beasley was on board in second class on the Titanic, and he published his account of that last night aboard the Titanic in his book, The Loss of the SS Titanic. Many brave things were done that night, he wrote, but none were more brave than those done by men playing minute after minute as the ship settled quietly lower and lower in the sea. The music they played served like their own immortal requiem and their right to be recalled in the scrolls of undying fame. And what he was talking about there, Scott, was the band playing on, which is such a huge piece of the Titanic story as we know it today. So you really nailed it with that question because so much of what we know of that night was handed down to us by people like Lawrence Beasley and uh, other journalists. There was a a female journalist who was a columnist for Women's Wear Daily. She had just been in Paris covering the Easter Sunday races for the magazine. And um, she was known to talk quite a lot to reporters when she returned to the United States. And she shared a lot of information about that last night on the Titanic Her version of what happened with the band is quite different than Lawrence Beasley. She insisted that she would be surprised that any band would play a song like Nearer My God to Thee when that would have caused a panic and would not have set a a really positive tone for people who were faced with that uh, great disaster that night. So there's, there's quite a bit of back and forth about that. And we cover that in the book in a chapter about did the band play on? Right. And that's a good point because I think that the event of the sinking of the Titanic, it would have been significant no matter what happened because of such a huge loss of life at one time and what the Titanic symbolized as this so-called unsinkable ship. But because there are these romantic elements that were so quickly tied into it, like the band playing on, and we're arguing about, did it happen? Did it not happen? Did it happen the way we remember it? We at least remember it because of these stories that are told. So it still takes on this romantic element. And we're talking about it now when there's no one alive who's a survivor. Do I have that right? Is there, are there any survivors still alive? You have that right. The last survivor passed away many years ago, and she was just a baby when she was aboard the Titanic. Right. And so this is something that is four or five generations ago. This is pre-World War I. There really is something to say that those who added these uh, features and poetic elements to what the sinking meant really did their job well. So I'd like to get into more of these people that you've profiled and chronicled and hear their story. The first is Paul Danby. So tell us about Paul Danby and why he was significant and what his story was with the Titanic. Sure. So Paul Danby was actually not a passenger aboard the Titanic, but he actually wrote the letter that was mailed from the Titanic, the first letter 
mailed from the Titanic. He was seeing off his wife's uncle, Adolfa Salfeld, who was a first-class passenger. He was seeing him off in Southampton. The Titanic sailed from Southampton and, you know, made two stops before she head out across the Atlantic Ocean, two stops after that. So this was her first stop where a great majority of the passengers boarded. And one of them was Paul Danby's uncle, Adolfa Selfeld. Um, and he is interesting in his own right in that he wrote an amazing letter uh, as well. We'll talk about him in a little bit. Uh, and he was also in recent news stories because vials of perfumes that he was carrying to the United States to start a new uh, entrepreneurial business were discovered at the rec site intact. And there were all sorts of different um, vials that were labeled in Geranus and Carnation, Perganol, um, all the different types of fragrances that you would imagine a perfume entrepreneur would be carrying. But on that first day, uh, his his nephew by his wife, um, his his uh, niece's husband, Paul Danby, was seeing him off, and they both sat down and wrote letters together. And um, Paul wrote to his wife that he was on this incredible ship and so excited to see Uncle off, and um, you know talked about what the ship looked like, how majestic it was, how exciting it was. And it impressed him so much that he even took a few minutes to have a a little fun with it and sat down and took out some stationery and wanted to be sure to send something from the Titanic before he disembarked uh, when the, the Titanic sailed away without him. So in a way, he survived the Titanic by stepping off. And some 30 years later, he lost his life in the Holocaust at Sobibor concentration camp. He was um, uh, deported by the Nazis, he and his wife. And uh, it's a really um, heart-wrenching story that I was so fortunate to discover because it, it made me see the connection between the Titanic and the Holocaust, which is profound. Um, his granddaughter, Petra Burka, was the 1965 world figure skating champion. But a lot happened in between the 1940s and 1965. Uh, Paul and his whole family were deported to concentration camps. Um, one of his daughters was able to go into hiding, and so she was not included in that. Um, but when he and his wife were sent to Sobibor, his his daughter, Petra's mother, was in a work camp. With She had been assigned to a work camp that was led by the Nazis, and she was out picking peat moss off the ground. Um, you know, a, a really nasty job where you're you know digging peat moss and um, on your hands and knees all day. And someone came to her and said, you have a few minutes to go and see your parents being sent away. Um, and you have to come right back after just a few minutes. And one of the most memorable stories in my research is this one about how she went to the train station. Her name was Ellen and she was a young woman at the time. And she could see her parents in the doorway of the car and of the train car and they stood there looking at each other, the three of them, for a while. And then her mother went into uh, the the train car and left the doorway. But her father stayed there. And then it got to the point where she couldn't wait there any longer. And she knew she had to turn around and go back to working in the field, pulling the, the peat moss. And when I heard this story, I just thought how amazing it is, how, um, you know, the Titanic just has such such a far reach that it, it even has ties to the stories that are, are just so incredible in our world history, like the Holocaust. Yeah. I mean, with all the survivors they're like what we talked about in a previous episode, many of them are showing up on the battlefields of World War I, probably many in World War II as officers here as victims of the Holocaust in many other places. So it really spreads out from here in 1912 when this happens. Right. That was one of the most inspiring things to me as I did this research was 
how amazingly so many of these people went on from surviving that horrific tragedy to just going through more and more things that were trying circumstances like you wouldn't believe. Um, and, and we talked about that already with Baker, Charles Jockin. Um, you know, there's so many examples of that. And this is definitely one of those. Well, somebody else that was connected to uh, Paul Danby, we just touched on Adolfa Saalfeld a little bit, but can you talk a little bit more? You mentioned the perfume vials that were found. With Saalfeld, something that you mentioned is that there was a sense of uh, survivor guilt that happened with him. So could you talk about that? So as you know, in those days, it was women and children first, and that was strictly enforced by officers and passengers and crew alike. Um, and in the case of many of these survivors, even when they survived, they didn't really survive because they were racked with the guilt and the scorn that they faced publicly when they uh, returned home. In the case of Adolfa Selfeld, uh, he saw a lifeboat that hardly anyone was in and there were no women around that were hoping to get into it. And so he boarded the lifeboat like, you know, so many of us would have done. And, you know, he for many years had a terrible time trying to sleep after the Titanic. There was, there were so many different instances of people who, um, you know, one couple even had to move out of the city of Minneapolis and move to the suburbs because as their great nephew told me, they were just racked with the memories of those noises and sounds of that night for the rest of their lives. They, um, you know, the ambulances of the city and all the sights and sounds of the city, they really just could live without. So they went to the suburbs. And um, in the case of people like Adolfa Selfeld, it was the survivor guilt that affected them as well as those other feelings and so forth. And all of that combined just made life very difficult for Adolfa. When he returned home to London, uh, he would even need sometimes on really bad nights, his trusted chauffeur, Patch, called him Patch, who, um, that was his nickname, he had been with him for years, he would turn to him to have to drive him through the streets of London, the, the dark, often dreary, rainy streets of London, to help him fall asleep, or he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. It was it was that bad. So, uh, and many people, you know, remarked that he, he looked like a much older man when he passed away than he actually was. Um, Adolfa is really special in my research because, up until I started researching for the last night in the Titanic, Scott, I was, you know, just mostly familiar with that last menu in first class on April 14th, the last night on the Titanic. And then when I started delving into this further about other foods and menu items that were aboard the Titanic, I looked to things like letters and menus that were saved that weren't as maybe famous or popular as that last first class dinner menu was. And one of the letters I found and something that really sparked my, um, you know, tenacity to keep going with this was the letter that Adolfo wrote to his wife, Gertrude, on the day he boarded, he uh, boarded in Southampton with his, um, his niece's husband, Paul Danby he saw him off there and then he took a nap. He, he had lunch, took a nap, did all the kinds of things we would, we would do on our first day getting settled into a big ship like the Titanic. And um, he wrote about how there was hot and cold running water in his cabin. He told his wife all about this big lunch he had eaten. He had had uh, soup, filet of place, which is a flounder like fish, it's a lot like flounder, um, a loin chop with cauliflower. He had fried potatoes and he ate an apple Manhattan for dessert, some Roquefort cheese. And then he said he washed it all down with a Spaten beer iced. And that's really interesting because uh, one of the things we know for sure is that Wrexham Lager was one of the suppliers for the Titanic and they supplied the, the beer, Wrexham Lager, uh, which is a Munich draft. And um, we can assume that that was probably what Adolfo was talking about in his letter to his wife, Gertrude. 
Um, and he also told her that he was uh, took a long walk. I uh, called it a promenade and dozed for an hour until about 5 p.m. He said the band played in the afternoon for tea, but instead he had a coffee and some bread and butter in the Veranda Cafe. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. So we get this really great insight into the joys that he experienced on that very first day on the Titanic. He also was really surprised that he thought he would have to pay for everything, but he found out that the food was uh, free. So um, he he told her that he didn't know if he'd have uh, he'd be up early enough in the morning the next morning when the Titanic arrived in Queenstown, which is now called Cobe. Um, so he wanted a man that night. So um, it's a pretty amazing insight that Adelpha provides us so many years later when the menu resurfaced and um, it sold at the auction in 2009. Yeah, it was for a lot of money and wasn't a letter that he wrote to his wife, Gertrude. Wasn't that also auctioned off for a lot? Yes, he definitely belongs in this episode of writers because, you know, that lost art of letter writing, you know, we think of the vacations we take or business travel we do nowadays. And, you know, how many times do we even send a postcard anymore? And so that's one of the things that I'm glad this book celebrates is that lost art of letter writing. Today, you would bore someone to death with pictures of a trip or maybe people would check out your Instagram account to see what you're doing. But here, you have to somehow transport that person to where you are with words alone. So you have to provide sensory experiences and these descriptions. So from a book perspective of trying to put together these accounts, it's very helpful instead of just relying on visuals or video or things like that to try to recreate this. Oh, yeah. I love that comparison of, you know, today with Instagram, we can take a picture quick and share it. And back in Adolfo's day, he had to sit down and, you know, write all this out word for word and be very descriptive. I think also we get a lot of these nice uh, pithy quotes with different things that happened. And somebody that you mentioned, uh, I guess more in passing, but Edith Rosenbaum Russell, who is a female correspondent at this time, which I thought was interesting. What did she say about the Titanic disaster? Well, she was very outspoken about, you know, in later years, there's a BBC interview of her talking about, uh, you know, many of her experiences that night. One of the most delightful is about a pig music box that her mother had given her, and she used it in the lifeboat to help distract the children, and of course, probably the adults too, and bringing a little bit of hope and and cheer in this uh, little, the music that this little pig played. You could wind the pig up with its tail and it played the Maxiques, which is a, which is a Brazilian dance tune. So it was some little remnant of some upbeatness that she could bring to those uh, people with her in the lifeboat. And I think it says a lot about Edith and just her tenacity and um, thinking of others at a time like that. Um, And she was the person who so famously said, I'm accident prone. I've been in shipwrecks, car crashes, fires, floods, and tornadoes, and I've had every disaster but bubonic plague and a husband. So um, she is quite a character and really interesting to me as a, a journalist of her day, so unusual for her to be an international correspondent back in 1912. And she was a correspondent for Women's Wear Daily, which is pretty interestingly, um, it had just started only two years before the Titanic sailed. Yeah. And there was another uh, journalistic figure that I dabbled in that professionally, but this was someone I hadn't heard of, William Stead, who some say that he established investigative journalism. What did he do and what was his experience on the Titanic? Well, he was well known for establishing or introducing probably rather investigative journalists. So he's pretty special to me to have Having been a, a New York Post uh, correspondent from Chicago, I, you know, I know a little bit about investigative journalism, and of course, I zeroed right in on his story as well. And what is incredibly remarkable about him is that um, he wrote a story 
and it was titled How the Mail Steamer Went Down in Mid-Atlantic by a Survivor. But guess what, Scott? It was written in 1886. Can you believe that? He's had experience with sinking ships then. Well, and he kind of had a premonition about things. There were, you know, many people who claimed to have had six cents, special thoughts that you wouldn't expect. And he was one of those. Um, in the story, two steamships collide and there aren't enough lifeboats. Isn't that interesting? So um, he said, in, this is exactly what might take place. And will take place if liners are sent to sea short of boats, he wrote. Um, And then he also wrote a story, which is, I mean, if you have a hard time believing that, you'll have an even harder time believing what's more. He wrote a, a piece of fiction also before the Titanic sailed. And it was titled From the Old World to the New. It was a story about a clairvoyant. On board of all things, a White Star Line ship, which, of course, the Titanic was a White Star Line ship, and uh, the clairvoyant senses that another ship has hit an iceberg. So um, it's it's pretty amazing his story. It, he also comes up in recollections of people who claim they thought they saw him have a cigarette on the deck, and that was the last they saw of either one of them. Um, he was sitting alone reading in the first class smoking room. And there were, um, you know, many, many men in the smoking room at that time, uh, when the iceberg, when the Titanic hit the iceberg at 1140 PM on Sunday night, April 14th, 1912. So he was sitting alone there reading and, you know, just quietly letting all the card games happen around him. And people were drinking their nightcaps and, hot toddies, people were drinking hot lemonade. And so um, he was there. Also, Adolfo Selfeld was in the room, the smoking room with him. And on the in the second class smoking room was the other journalist I mentioned earlier, Lawrence Beasley. I don't know if this account that uh, William Stead wrote is the one that I've seen elsewhere online. Lists I've seen of strange historical coincidences, I think, talk about this fictional work that was released before the Titanic sunk that has to do with um, this large steamer going down. And it's bizarre how many similarities there are. I don't know if this is Stead's book or not, but there's even cover art that looks like the Titanic going on as well. I don't know if that, some people will chalk that up to strange premonitions. Maybe that also means that some people like him who knew about this type of uh, ocean going activity could see that if changes weren't made, then something like this was going to happen. Too bad that more people didn't heed the warning. There's another figure, too, Jacques Futrell, who is also uh, smoking as the ship is going down. And he's with some of the prominent figures that maybe some of us have heard of if we know about the Titanic. Uh, Can you tell me about him? Well, the last we know of Jacques Futrell, the author of The Thinking Machine, which was a a mystery that featured um, a professor, Augustus, S.F.X. Van Dusen. What, a, what an interesting name for a character. Um, the last we know is that he was on the starboard bridge wing, and at least one survivor said that he was with John Jacob Astor IV smoking a cigarette and when the Titanic was going down. And we don't know any more of him, but his wife, Lily May, survived. And as you were you know, asking about earlier, you know, did these writers help us get a glimpse at what life was like on the Titanic. And well, not so much from Jacques Futrell, his wife, Lily May had quite a bit to say about her experiences. And she said, um, there was not the slightest thought of danger in the minds of those who sat around the tables in the luxurious dining saloon of the Titanic. Um, she said that jewels flashed from the gowns of the women And, oh, the dear women, she wrote, how fondly they wore their latest Parisian gowns. Because remember, this was, you know, spring and people were coming back with their spring clothes to show off. And uh, many of these people had endless amounts of money to spend. And they, they did that very well on the streets of Paris, getting their new clothes. So it was the first time that most of them had an opportunity to display their newly acquired finery, she writes. 
Right. And she also mentions uh, seeing Madeline Astor. Is this the wife of John Jacob Astor IV? Yes, it is. Okay. What did he say or what did she say about her? Well, you know, I didn't come across this so much, but she did describe Madeline Astor, who was the 19-year-old bride of John Jacob Astor IV, as frantic while she was in the lifeboat waiting for it to be launched. But when I read that, I thought, well, boy, I you know, can't imagine anybody who wasn't frantic at a point like that. Right. I know I certainly would be. So I think it was just because of Madeline's stature in society, especially after having married into the Astor family, people, you know, scrutinized her much more heavily than other people. Very similar to how we scrutinize celebrities today. Um, she did say that her husband, meaning John Jacob Astor IV, had to jump into the lifeboat four times to tell her that he would be rescued later. And um, that was a story that ran in the Baltimore Sun about a week or about five days after the Titanic sank. By him jumping in, does that mean that he had to sort of assuage her concerns that he would come along at some point, even though he wasn't able to? Right, just to go. And and he wanted to be right next to her to reassure her and encourage her. And, And like I said, you know, we can... Take that for what it's worth. It's one person's account. Um, I I did not read that anywhere else other than her account. Well, first of all, I'm interested that a lot of the writers you've mentioned are in first class. It's very hard for me to imagine any writer today in any sort of first class on any type of ship. So the publishing (laughs) publishing industry had a lot more money back then, or at least more people read newspapers. But there is someone who is traveling maybe more along the lines of what a contemporary writer would, and that's Lawrence Beasley, who is in uh, the second class, or at least the second class smoking lounge. And he has influence, too, on the written legacy of the Titanic. So what was his story? Well, he published his story, uh, The Loss of the SS Titanic. And he talked about, as I mentioned earlier, about how the the band did play on. And it was very heroic, you know, what they were able to do um, by, by, you know, continuing to play on by inspiring people. He was in the second class smoking lounge and, um, you know, probably drinking a nightcap or something like that. Um, something like the Bronx cocktail, which, you know, was very popular at the time. It had just been invented at, uh, John Jacob Astor the fourth's Waldorf Astoria hotel. Um, and it, was a a whole new departure to the martini. It really celebrated oranges, which were a luxury item in those days. It was really hard to get your hands on oranges. And it was uh, a mix of sweet and dry vermouth, gin and orange juice. So, um, you know, it's, it's one of those drinks that we want to celebrate in the book as pre-prohibition, Things that, you know, were definitely aboard the Titanic. They would have been made aboard um, the Titanic in one of the smoking rooms, for instance, or elsewhere. And um, that is the recipe that I chose for the culinary spotlight for today. We always like to wrap up our episodes with a culinary spotlight. And I think this is really fitting because if we're talking about writers, I mean, we have to talk about hard alcohol. It just, it goes with the profession. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. I think this is interesting because this particular cocktail, it's part of a whole genre of cocktails that are similar to this. I think the Robert Burns is kind of like this or the Manhattan has a, it's a variation, but it's something that was big in the 20th century, took a hard hit with prohibition then seems to be coming back with tremendous force. If you go to any craft cocktail bar, this type of thing is going to be prominently featured. I'm a completionist, and I just love to hear how this is described. So what particularly goes into this cocktail uh, with the Bronx, at least as you have found it? Well, one of the uh, people that contributed several recipes to the book is Frank Cafefa. And um, he was the bar manager at the Waldorf Astoria in Peacock Alley before it closed for renovations. Um, the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. Of course, now there are many all around the world. And and Frank Caefa was there in New York. Um, the, the original location, or, or almost the original. At one point, 
the Waldorf Astoria was not the Waldorf Astoria. It was just the Astor Hotel. Then there was the Waldorf Hotel. And John Jacob Astor IV and his cousin, William Waldorf, merged their hotel not too long before the Titanic, um, within you know a few years before the Titanic sailed. So um, Frank redid the Waldorf Astoria bar book. He, he came up with a whole new version of it, which is fabulous. And um, he included in the book the Bronx from the um, old Waldorf Astoria bar days version. And it's an ounce and a half of Plymouth gin, three quarters ounces Martini and Rossi sweet vermouth, three quarters ounces Noali Pat Pratt uh, extra dry vermouth, or you can use really any, either, you don't need to have Martini and Rossi or Nawali Pratt, but um, either one of those would be um, what he would use. But sweet and dry are really the keys there. And then two orange peels. Um, he likes to use two one by two inch peels, and he snaps them to release the oils and then um, adds that to the mixing glass with a dash of Reagan's orange bitters number six. And, you know, I think you, you'd want to use orange with that because um, it's orange juice based drink. So um, you add all the ingredients to a mixing glass and you add the ice and stir for 30 seconds. You strain it into a chilled cocktail glass and garnish with an orange peel. Yeah, that sounds solid. And this is not your Minimate concentrate orange juice. This is Early 20th century, freshly grown oranges to recreate the experience as much as possible. Sounds like that's the key. Yeah, his uh, recipe that I just mentioned is very natural and organic. Um, and I've, I've had a Bronx many ways where it is sort of the Minute made variety where you put in about an, an ounce of orange juice. And I really like that too. It's a nice... Um, alternative to a mimosa. Yeah. It's a little drier and, and, you know, not as syrupy or sticky, like you can, you know, the sticky mimosas, which are fabulous too. And, um, you know, they definitely are, you can get your mimosa cravings too, but it's a little bit more of a sophisticated taste <laughs> for a brunch or it doesn't have to be brunch. It can be, you know, after dinner nightcaps, like Lawrence Beasley might have been drinking in the second class smoking room on the last end of the Titanic. But, um, you know, we, we really are uh, happy about the way this book celebrates those pre-prohibition drinks that have really fallen through the cracks in history. And this is definitely one of those. When I go out and order one, I am usually kind of, you know, looked at pretty quizzically by folks that haven't heard of a Bronx before. Well, there you go. And this is something for people to try out. And whether you realize it or not, you're being transported back in time to what a lot of people could have very well had. And I don't know what percentage of people were drinking it, but it sound like, sounds like it was the trendy thing to do at the time. So those who were more experimental in their culinary interests probably would have tried this out. Well, it was very trendy at the time. And in fact, the Waldorf Astoria, they knew they had a hit. And um, they knew they had to start ordering a lot of oranges. You know, As soon as it was sampled for the first time, someone was overheard to say, we better order a lot of oranges. And um, there was there was an article in the St. Louis Post Dispatch that talked about, um, you know, the Bronx cocktails and how they're becoming so popular. It's the headline said five of them are a plenty, and you know they talked about all the um, benefits of a wonderful Bronx cocktail. Um, and there's a a little cartoon in the book that I love, and it's a it's from September. Um, 1911, which would have been um, several months before the Titanic sailed. And it said, why not let hotels sell Bronx cocktails on Sundays? And I love that because it talks about, you know, you couldn't go out and order a cocktail like that on a Sunday in many places back in 1911. It was so different then. And I love that where people talking about the health benefits. So back then, doctors were really on your side when it came to vice. Smoke a cigarette. It calms the nerves. Now, anything that is moderately good tasting always comes with this huge package of guilt that, well, you can do it, but it has to be your cheat day and you have to feel bad. So I guess we do get longevity in the trade-off and, you know, not dying of diseases, but hey, you can at least feel a little bit better about it. 
Well, I did want to um, say, you know, when you mentioned about the Minute Maid orange juice versus just using the peel, the story in the St. Louis Postage Dispatch said, um, use the orange, not the peel. And that's what their advice was. And then, you know, uh, as far as the popularity of the drink, it was the signature drink in September of 1911 when President Taft visited St. Louis, which is why I think this article ran. Um, it was for a welcome breakfast at the Mercantile Club. And there was um, a lot of opposition expressed for weeks about, you know, the the drink and so forth. So it was really making headlines back in those days. All right, there you go. What was happening culinary-wise on the Titanic, it's not just isolated there, but it's part of these much wider trends that are going on. Well, Veronica, thanks for sharing all this with us. And as always, in the show notes for this series, people can go and check them, and then we have all the recipes and everything else. So if they want to follow up or experiment, they're welcome to do that. So that's all for this episode. In the next one, we're going to continue to explore the cast of characters who were there on the last night on the Titanic. We're going to be looking at the cooks and the ice cream makers. See you there. Thanks for listening to the Last Night on the Titanic podcast. To listen to all the episodes in the series, go to lastnightonthetitanicpodcast.com. There you'll also find show notes, biographical profiles of the passengers and crew on the Titanic, and recipes for all the recipe spotlights that we do in the series. One last thing, if you like the show, please rate and review it on the podcast listener of your choice. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.